my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OC OCRA spectroscopy. So in this video it is dedicated to uh, spectroscopy techniques for OCR. So if you are studying OCR chemistry then this video is specifically tailored for you. Um, there is a wide range of other videos as well for OCRA uh, right across the spectrum from year one to year two covering all the specific topics that you need to know. Um, if you have a look on my YouTube channel, Allery Chemistry, where you found this video probably, um, then you'll find the full range there. They're all for free. And please subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button and show your support for this channel. Let's just keep it free and keep it accessible for everybody. Um, you can, um, if you want a, a personal copy of these slides, though, that I've, that I've made, then you can get them. All you have to do is just click on the link in the uh, subscription box, uh, subscription box, in the, uh, in the description box. And we'll get the right one day um, in the description box below um, and you'll be able to purchase them there. They're great value for money. Um, you can use them on your tablet, on your smartphone um, um, and you can use them um, wherever you are to supplement your revision that you've got as well. Um, also, this video obviously just goes through the, um, the content for OCRA. Um, it is just as important to do exam technique as well and practice them exam questions because it's one thing knowing the content, it's another thing being able to adapt that and apply that into exam questions. Now, thankfully, I've got some videos uh, on Allo Chemistry where we go through past paper work throughs and go through the exam technique uh, just to make sure that you know um, that you can um, answer the questions properly and you can use the correct terminology because that's what it's all about is you using the keywords um, in your answers to make sure that you are actually um, communicating like a scientist shall we say um, and just make sure you've got all that all that sorted as well okay right so let's have a look at the specification so this specification is primarily NMR um, so there's a lot of information on NMR both types proton and carbon 13 NMR and we also look at combined techniques as well so just looking at how we can uh, combine all the techniques including elemental analysis to um, to deduce uh, uh, to deduce a, a compound so there's a lot of um, this has probably got to be one of the one of the more difficult topics I think NMR is quite tricky um, it's one of these topics that you need to practice a lot at but um, hopefully this video should give you a good footing and um, you should be able to be aware and do it so when while I was at uni, um, I spent a, a lot of time analysing uh, spectra. Um, it was uh, it's one of the things you can you can easily get frustrated on. So don't uh, don't feel too disheartened if um, you know if uh, if it's if it doesn't work out as it as it meant to be in the first time. But anyway, let's just get on with it, shall we? So um, let's have a look at the first bit. Let's look at the introduction about what NMR actually is. So NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay. Um, so spectroscopy, um, NMR spectroscopy, it's used to determine the structure of a molecule. This is really, really important and so vital because now we can actually build, it's almost like a jigsaw. It's like we've got an unknown jigsaw, unknown uh, picture on a jigsaw and we have to piece little bits together. That's how I describe NMR as. Um, just a, a little bit of a fun fact just before we move on as well. NMR... Um, uh, well, it's not fun, but it's like a trivia fact. Anyway, uh, NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance, but uh, MRI is actually the technique that they uh, that they use in um, as, well, the same technique that they use in uh, hospitals. It's the same type of equipment. They call it magnetic resonance imaging. Um, but yeah, if you stick around towards the end of the video, um, I'll tell you why they have why they've changed the wording of it, even though the equipment's the same why they've actually changed the wording. Instead of using NMR, they use MRI in hospitals. So I'll, I'll tell you towards the end of the video. Right, so let's have a look. So there's two main types of NMR. So first one is carbon-13 NMR, and this tells information on how carbon atoms are actually arranged in an atom. And high-resolution proton NMR tells us information about how hydrogen atoms are arranged. So you'll see both of them later on. So if an atom... Has, if an atomic nucleus has an odd number of nucleons, that's protons and neutrons, then it has a nuclear spin. Okay, that's going to be important because you're going to see how that fits in later. Okay, so it's got to have an odd number. So this nuclear spin creates a weak magnetic field. And NMR, all an NMR machine does is detect how these magnetic fields are affected by a larger external magnetic field. Hence the word magnetic in there. And the word nuclear 
uh, is because you've got a nucleus. It's, it's, it's to do with the nucleus, so it's a nuclear spin number of nucleons. So this is where the words are coming from. So hydrogen has one proton and so does have a nuclear spin because it's an odd number. Carbon normally has six protons and six neutrons. However, a tiny proportion of them, so 1%, is carbon-13. Um, and this has seven neutrons, so that does have a nuclear spin. So carbon-12 doesn't, but carbon-13 does. So it must have an odd number. If it's not odd, it cannot work in an NMR machine. Okay, so that's very, very important. So nuclei, they spin in random directions. So this is the, the nucleus of the atom. Okay. However, when we have an external magnetic field that is applied to it, um, they apply, they align in two different directions. So one will spin one way and some will spin the other way. Okay. So here we are. So nuclei that spin in the direction of the external magnetic field or against it, and those that spin in the direction of the magnetic field have lower energy, and those that spin against the magnetic field have have a higher energy. Okay, so you can see here on this diagram, I've shown I've represented the nuclei spin by arrows, and when there's no magnetic field applied, the nuclei just spin in whatever direction they please. Okay, so they'll spin in all sorts of directions. Um, and some will have higher energy and some have low energy, but there's no order to it. Okay, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no structure to this at all. So when we apply an external magnetic field, this is what happens. So there's your magnetic field coming through, and we have two different. So we have some nuclei that spin with the magnetic field, and some that spin against it. An NMR machine is effectively applying an external magnetic field to alter the uh, nuclei or uh, nucleon spin so what happens is nmr fires out radio waves at a specific frequency and so the nuclei that are aligned with the magnetic field absorb the energy and flip to the higher level okay so nmr's first of all it applies an external magnetic field then it then it fires out radio waves and you can see here that these ones here will absorb some of that energy if there's sufficient energy then they'll flip up to the top um, up to a higher energy up at the top here. Are you following so far? Okay, so those with higher energy can also drop to lower energy and emit radio waves. So these ones here can then drop back down. Remember, as this saying that energy, uh, sorry, the atoms are incredibly lazy and nucleons are exactly the same. They don't want to be in as higher energy. Why would they? You know, there's no, if you're being a lower energy, why would you, why would you be in higher energy? So you have to give it energy to push it up there in the first place. But some of these drop back down again and they emit some radio waves. Now, initially, there's more nuclei aligned with the magnetic field. So overall, more energy is absorbed than emitted. Okay. And NMR measures the amount of energy absorbed. Okay. So NMR is effectively saying how much energy is required to lift this nucleon into a higher energy spin. Okay. So that's what NMR does. It's pretty nifty stuff. It's quite complicated. Okay. So the energy absorbed by the nuclei is dependent upon the environment that that's in, okay? So that gap, remember that gap, and just keep that in your mind when you're thinking about NMR. It's that gap between the lower energy and the higher energy uh, nucleons. So that gap, the size of that gap is dependent on what, what atom, what environment are them nucleons in? In other words, are they near another atom? Um, are they completely isolated? Are they near five atoms or two atoms, etc.? So, So a nucleus can be shielded so remember that nucleus it can be shielded from that external magnetic field from electrons surrounding the nucleus okay so you've got electrons that are in there um electrons that surround that nucleus and that protects it it like cocoons it almost so it's a bit like um it's a bit like going down a rocky hill but you're cocooned in um in bubble wrap and the more bubble wrap you have around you then the more protected you are going to be from bumps and knocks so atoms and groups of atoms adjacent to the nucleus affect the level of electron shielding. For example, an electro electronegative element such as oxygen near a carbon near a carbon atom will reduce the electron shielding on a carbon atom. So if you've got, and this is similar, if you think about it, this is similar to it's not the same principle, but it helps to explain it. So when you've got um, uh, when you've got a, a dipole, remember you've got um, you've got a dipole, you've got an electronegative element bonded to an, a, a carbon atom, let's say. That electronegative element is effectively pulling electrons away from that carbon, 
okay, or in the bond. It's pulling it away from it. So this is a similar thing in the sense that if we have a um, if we have a, a, a electronegative element, it's effectively removing some of that cushioning, okay, and that means you're going to be you're going to feel the bumps a little bit more as you, as you roll down that hill. Um, okay, so the magnetic field will be felt by the nuclei differently depending on the environment that it's in as they absorb different amounts of energies in different frequencies. And it's this difference that the NMR machine is picking up, okay? So that difference there, the NMR is detecting that, but that difference in the in the spin levels changes depending on what that atom is bonded next to, okay? So it's influenced. It's a bit like a street. So you've got one person who, say a neighbor decides to cut the hedge. I know it, it, it happens here. So let's say if a neighbor decides to cut the hedge, and then another neighbor looks and thinks, oh, I'm influenced by that. I'm going to cut my hedge as well. And then another neighbor says, I'm going to cut my hedge. So it's like influenced, okay? But if nobody cut the hedges, um, then you're probably less likely to do it. So it's like you're kind of almost subconsciously following what other people do. And you're influenced by other people in the street. So um, this is the same with NMR, except depending on what the atom they're living next to, depends on how much they're influenced by if you see what I mean. So it's really difficult concept to get across. I'm trying to make it a little bit more tangible. Okay, so the environment is determined by the groups of atoms that exist near the nuclei being examined. Okay, so we look along the full chain, not just the atoms immediately bonded to the atom being examined. So for example, if I live in a house and somebody right next door to me, I'm not just influenced by the person immediately next door to me, I'm influenced by people further down the street as well, say four, five, six houses down, and same the other way, on the other side of the street as well. So it's the same with atoms in a molecule. That carbon is not just influenced by the immediate atom, either side of it, or the hydrogen, it's influenced by a full range of atoms all the way down that carbon chain, if it is a carbon molecule, let's say. They're carbon-based molecules. So influence stretches beyond the immediate vicinity. That's what we're saying, okay? It's a bit like social media, isn't it? Right, okay. So for an atom to be in the same environment, it must be bonded to an atom or group of atoms that are identical, okay? So the next slide shows some examples. Okay, so all of this is just showing the mechanics of an NMR machine. I think it's important that you understand how that works because I think if you know what's going on with an NMR machine, how it how it functions, basically you're getting into the mind of NMR, um, then you can kind of then interpret what you see on the spectra and you think, oh, that kind of makes sense. Okay, so hopefully that, that makes it a bit clearer. Okay, so here's a range of examples that look at identifying carbon and hydrogen environments. So let's have a look at this one. So here we've got a, a carbon uh, molecule, a carbon chain here, hydrocarbon. So here we can see we've got two carbon environments, okay? The purple C, or CHBr, which is this bit here, is bonded to two CH3 groups. So we've got one there and one there. So that is identical. There's an identical uh, setup left and right of that. And also there's two red C's and these are both bonded to the same carbon with the same bromine and hydrogen attached to it. So effectively there's two carbon environments in this molecule. Okay. So let's have a look at the next one. So in this one, all I've done is I've just moved the bromine to the other side. Okay. Exactly the same number, uh, exact, exactly the same molecular formula, but I've just moved the bromine. But look at the difference it makes to NMR. Okay, so we now have three carbon environments. So this is what I mean. NMR is great for determining a structure. There's no way a mass spectrometer, um, a standard mass spectrometer could pick that up because it's just a subtle change, but NMR can. So here are three carbon environments. We've got the green carbon here, which is CH2Br, so that's one. The purple carbon, which is this one here, so that's bonded to two hydrogens, so that's bonded to CH2Br and CH3. And then the red carbon, which is this one, is bonded to CH2, CH2Br. So you can see, write them down. So write down, this helps a lot, I think, when you're determining uh, environments, is write down what's left and what's right, okay? And what's up and what's down. So write it down and say, have you repeated yourself? You can see here, none of these have repeated myself. If you haven't repeated yourself, the chances are it's a different environment. Here's another one. So this one's got two hydrogen environments in it. So we've cut the number of carbons here. So remember we have two types of NMR. We've got carbon environments. So we've got carbon-13 NMR and we've got hydrogen or proton NMR. So this is looking at protons. So that's what you need to be focusing on. So here 
we have two hydrogen environments. These two hydrogens are in the same environment because they're bonded to um, uh, they're bonded to a CH3, as you can see there. Okay, and then you've got three hydrogen environments, the three purple ones here, and these are bonded to a CH2 Br. Okay, so you can see here yeah, this is just looking at hydrogen environments, and here's one more. So here in this one, this time we've added, we've placed a hydrogen with a bromine. We only actually have one hydrogen environment. So we've got um, all these hydrogens, whether it's these hydrogens here are bonded to a CH2 Br, and these hydrogens here are bonded to a CH2 Br. They're both bonded to the same you know, you're repeating yourself, you're bonded to the same thing. So they're equal distance, the equidistance from the electronegative bromine atom. So that's a bit like if you've got a neighbor who's um, who has a strong influence that might be, make me, you know, they might make a lot of noise or they might have, you know, the, the best garden or something like that. You know, if you're, if you're, if you've got a neighbor in the middle and you've got one either side of that neighbor, then both of them houses are equally affected by that one in the in the middle because there's there's symmetry there, the symmetry. So this is exactly the same with NMR. Okay, so we now we we can identify environments in carbons and hydrogens, and we know that there's two different types of NMR. Okay, so what we need to do is we need when we're testing something in an NMR machine. We need to have a standard. We need to have a reference point. And that reference point is tetramethylsilanes, or TMS. It's a chemical used as a standard when we're looking at chemical shift in NMR spectra. So a nuclei, as nuclei absorb different amounts of energy at different frequencies, it's difficult to measure the magnitude of these without a reference to something, a standard. And we use tetramethylsilane, which is TMS. It has this structure here. Okay, so TMS has 12 hydrogens all in identical environments and this will produce a large single peak well away from sample peaks it's also inert it's non-toxic and um, it's uh, it's volatile as well so it's easy to remove from your sample now what you'll notice here is that this is looking at either you can either look at this as a carbon environment or a hydrogen environment but you see there's an incredible amount of symmetry there so because this molecule is symmetrical all these hydrogens here are all in the same environment and we've got loads of hydrogens all in one environment so that's why it produces a strong peak and we've also got loads of carbons in the same environment they're all bonded to the same one so that's going to show one strong peak okay so the difference between the tms peak and the peaks produced by the substances under test is the chemical shift okay which is given this little um, this little uh, delta delta symbol here so we measure chemical shift in parts per million, so PPM. Um, it's because it's used as a standard to measure against, we assign this zero, okay? So we always say, right, we're gonna you know, re readjust our spectrum to zero. It's a bit like having scales, bathroom scales or, or kitchen scales, and you set it to zero first before you actually put anything, uh, before you actually put anything on it. So you always set to zero, and then you know, relative to zero, you know how heavy something weighs. So this is the same with NMR. So if we look at an NMR spectra, you'll often see that peak at um, at zero. Um, this is your TMS peak. Okay, it's a very strong peak at zero. Uh, it's used to calibrate your NMR machines while we're analysing samples. So if in the exam they ask you, there's a peak at zero and it's quite a big peak. Let's say if it's any peak at zero, then that is because of TMS. So just um, as long as you as long as you're aware of that, and it's just a reference. Okay, so let's start and look into these spectra in a little bit more detail and start to specialize in each of the areas. So we're going to look at carbon 13 spectroscopy first. And this tells us how many different carbon environments there are in the sample being tested. So the peaks in a carbon 13 spectra tells us the number of different carbon environments. So for example, let's look at um, one of the ones that we've seen before already. So each carbon in the molecule is in a different environment as there is a different amount of electron shielding. So we can see two peaks associated with chloroethane. So here's the NMR spectrum and here's this here. So you can see we've got um, from a carbon environment, we've got one environment there and one environment there because well, this one is bonded to a chlorine directly and this one is indirectly bonded to a chlorine because it's a little bit further up that chain. So it's got different shielding. So the red carbon, this one here, 
is closest to the electronegative chlorine. And this means the electron shielding is a lot lower because remember that chlorine is pulling electrons away from that carbon. So it's more influenced by um, by the external elect um, magnetic field that we're applying to it. So the shielding's lower. So that means the chemical shift is higher. Okay, so if that shift moves further up the spectrum, that means that element is really quite influenced by something um, electronegative. So it has a much bigger shift up there. And then the green one, the green carbon, is further away from the chlorine. So this means that the electron shielding is higher. So it's not being influenced as much by that electronegative element. And so therefore the chemical shift is lower. And so remember that peak at zero is caused by TMS. So it's not a, it's not a, a big it's not as big as the other ones because you can adjust uh, an NMR spectrum to emphasize certain peaks, but it's a peak at zero, so it's TMS. So that's the that's the main criteria. Okay, so carbon thirteen, um, like I say, it tells us how many carbon environments there are in the sample being tested. So um, cyclic compounds are much more difficult to predict their spectra okay because there isn't a line a nice line where you can you can kind of measure the influence from one position um, and sometimes what we're looking for in cyclic compounds is symmetry okay um, and that will tell us um, atoms in different environments so let's have a look at this one so this one is a cyclic compound okay we've got two chlorines attached to it here and here's our carbon 13 spectrum so here you can see with 1,3-dichlorocyclohexane, there's four different carbon environments. We're looking for symmetry with cyclic compounds. It makes it a lot easier. So if we use this line of symmetry, we can see some of the similarity and differences of the carbon environments in this molecule. So let's, let's go through them. So we've got this one, which is this little peak here. Okay, so that one is sandwiched between two carbons with a chlorine. Okay, we've then got these two which are the same as each other. So that's that big peak there, okay? So they've got the same um, the, the same environment. They're both bonded to a chlorine and they're both equally distant away from each other in terms of the, the separated by one carbon in the middle and they are separated by uh, one, two, three carbons on the other side as well. So they do have symmetry as you can see. Okay, so these ones are the same. So that's that purple one there. Okay, they're a little bit further away from the chlorine, so that's why the shift isn't as high, as you can see. Um, and the final one is that one, is the orange one. So that's that peak. That's the furthest away from the chlorine, so the shift isn't as high. But the reason why this one is different to that one is because this one is sandwiched between, you know, what's next to it is a carbon with a chlorine and a carbon with a chlorine. What's next to this one is a carbon with a hydrogen and a carbon with a hydrogen. And that's why that one's in a different environment. So it's about looking, when you get a cyclic compound, look for symmetry, okay? And then break it down like that. And obviously that peak, again, is because of TMS. So we know about that already. Okay, right. So carbon-13, um, NMR chemical shifts have values and carbon environments can be determined. Now you will be given this um, either in your exam or on your data sheet. So you don't need to remember these numbers, but you are expected to interpret these numbers in a spectrum. So there's your data table there. So it looks something like that. It may not be exactly the same, um, but it would look something similar to that. So you've got your chemical shifts and you've got your type of carbon as well on the right. So what we can do is we can match up the position of the peaks in the spectrum to the table to work out what carbon environments exist. So there are some issues though, um, as you can probably see. So a peak at 190 will suggest a carbonyl group. However, we can't be sure if this is an aldehyde or a ketone. So it's not perfect, but it's given us some ideas. And there are overlaps as well. So for example, a peak at 60 could be an amine, an alcohol, an ester, or an ether, which could, which is not, which is not great. So you've got a, there's your 60 there and it could fit within within this spectrum as well. So so that could be quite tricky. So there's no, it's not perfect. And this is why when we look um, later on towards the end of the video, we'll look at combined spectral techniques because you can't just use one, uh, one spectral analysis. You've got to use a variety of them to build that picture up really. Okay, so let's have a look at a chemical which has the formula of C3H8O and its spectrum is shown below. And what we want to work out is its displayed formula. So first, what we have to do is draw down all the possible isomers of this uh, of this chemical here. 
So there they are. So we've got all our different isomers of C3H8O. So we've got um, we've got a primary alcohol here, a secondary alcohol, and we've also got an ether, which is over here. So what we're going to try and do is is deduce this. So what we need to do is look at the number of peaks. So we've got three. So there must be three different environments. So this rules out propan-2-ol as this only has two. So there we are. Okay. So that one rules that one out because this one's only got two environments. It's got one and two, so it's definitely not that. So let's carry on. So we have two peaks at 65 and 75, and this suggests that two carbons are bonded to an electronegative oxygen. So this fits the structure of an ether rather than propan-1-ol, which is your primary alcohol. In here, we would only see one peak in this area. Okay, so you wouldn't see that. So actually, that's not right, but that one is. Okay, so our answer is an ether. But what we're doing is using that data, and you'd have to have a data table in front of you to work this out. But um, we're using that information to work out what the what the formula could be. Okay, so let's look at proton NMR. So that's that's as much as you need to know for carbon 13. It's fairly straightforward. Proton NMR works in a similar way, except we have an additional feature to it, which is called um, splitting, uh, splitting patterns. So we're going to look at splitting patterns in a moment. But proton NMR spectroscopy tells us how many different hydrogen environments there are. So carbon 13 focused on the number of carbon environments. This one, we're going to look at the number of hydrogen environments. Okay. And this is the important thing is it tells us how many hydrogens there are in each environment. So this is this is even more powerful. So the peaks on a proton NMR spectrum tells us the number of different hydrogen environments. So here we've got a, a spectrum here and you can see we've got numbers next to the peaks now. Uh, and we've got this funny red line, which is called an integration trace. We'll come into that in a moment. So the one and three is actually telling us. There we are telling us the ratio of the areas under the peaks. Okay, so this allows us to work out the relative number of hydrogens in that environment. And sometimes these can be decimals, that's fine. Um, what we're looking for is just a ratio that don't have to be whole numbers. So this is a three to one ratio. So in other words, there's three times as many hydrogens in this environment as they're in in this environment. That's all that means. And if you do get decimals, just multiply it. Okay, it's just telling us the ratio of these. So with ethanol, we have two hydrogen environments. So you can see here, we've got the red one, which is the peak over there. And then we have these three, which are in another environment. So we've got two hydrogen environments. So we obviously have two peaks there. But you can see on one of the peaks, we've got a three, because that's telling us we've got three hydrogen environments in that area. And obviously the last one, we've only got one. And obviously that peak there at the end is caused by TMS. So the peak on the left has a value of 1, and the peak on the right has a value of 3. So we have 3 hydrogens in one environment, 1 in another. It's a 3 to 1 ratio, as we've said already. So the red line, like I say, this is what I said before, it's called an integration trace. And all this does is it just helps us to show the area ratio of the peak. And we'll look at this a little bit later on in more detail. Okay, so like carbon uh, carbon 13 NMR, we also have uh, proton NMR data as well. And basically the hydrogens marked in red, this is what causes the shift. Because we've got a lot of hydrogens in a molecule, um, it's important that we emphasize which hydrogens we're looking at. So, so those, these are the ones all marked in red. So if we're using the previous spectrum of ethanoic acid, we have a peak at 11.7. And we have a peak at 2.1. So there's our peak at 11.7 here. So that had the integration of 1, remember. Uh, and then we have one at 2.1, which is here. Um, and that had an integration of 3. So when we're looking at this, the 11.7 one fits right into this spectrum here. So that's a hydrogen on its own. It's shifted well up. So it must be very close to a electronegative elements, which it is. So this tells us it's, a ethanoic, it's, an, um, uh, it's a carboxylic acid that we have. And the peak at 2.1 tells us that actually we have a hydrogen which is near a carbon with a double bond oxygen. So that fits with that being near a carboxylic acid perhaps. So, so that tells us that this is 2.1 and that fits. Okay, so the proton NMR spectrum um, has peaks that split. So this is what I'm saying is the other feature. And what this does, this allows us to determine the structure. It's a little bit complicated, this, so, so bear with me. So peaks that split into smaller peaks is known as a splitting pattern. 
okay and the number of smaller peaks corresponds to the number of hydrogens on the adjacent carbon plus one okay so this is also known as spin spin coupling um, and the rule is called an n plus one rule so it depends on and you'll see the best thing is to look at an example actually because uh, that looks quite scary when you look at it just written like that so for example what we have um, a singlet peak uh, so if you have a peak and it's just not split into anything it's just a single peak what that tells us is that there are no hydrogens on a neighboring carbon. So if there's a carbon, if there is a carbon next door, there might not be. If there isn't a carbon, then you just get a single peak. But if there's a carbon next door and that carbon has no other hydrogens, then we get a singlet peak. If we get a doublet peak, so that's a peak that's split into two. So it's like a, a one, one peak that's split into two. Then what that's telling us is there is a, a carbon next door, but that carbon only has one hydrogen on it. That can either be left or right. So a triplet peak, so this is where the peak split into three, that means there is a carbon next door, um, but that carbon um, or carbons has two hydrogens uh, on that carbon. And the third one, so a quartet peak means, uh, sorry, the fourth one, a quartet peak means that a uh, peak split into four, that means that the carbon next to that one has got, um, has got three hydrogens on the neighboring carbon, okay? So let's have a look. So here's a, an NMR, proton NMR spectrum with the splitting patterns that you can see on there. So this is the uh, NMR spectrum for ethanol. So you can see here we've uh, broken them down into the different parts. So we've got a CH3, a CH2 and an OH. And we've got the splitting patterns associated with it. So the hydrogen on OH um, is bonded to an oxygen. Okay, so it's not even bonded to a carbon. So this means if we apply the n plus one rule obviously that it doesn't have any there's no carbons next to it with no hydrogens because there's no hydrogens there we apply the n plus one so that's zero because it's no hydrogens plus one equals one so it's a singlet and in fact that's exactly what we get we get a singlet so the hydrogens on ch2 are adjacent to one carbon that has three hydrogens on Okay, so applying the n plus one rule, that means we have, um, you can see here, so this has got two, this has got, um, there's two hydrogens here, but it's no, it's only next door to one carbon, and that carbon has one, two, three hydrogens applied to it. So we apply the three n plus one uh, rule, so that's three hydrogens plus one is four, so we get a quartet. And in fact, that's what we get there. So you can see CH2, you've got one, two, three, four distinct peaks there, okay? And then the hydrogens on the CH3 are adjacent to one carbon, which is here, and that carbon has two hydrogens on. So we apply the n plus one rule, so that's two plus one is three, and that's a triplet. And in fact, there's our triplet look. So we've got one, two, three peaks, three major peaks that's popping up there. Okay, so remember we looked at integration traces. So this is where we're gonna look at it in a little bit more detail. So integration traces show the areas under a peak more clearly, and this helps us to work out the hydrogen ratio. So when we have split peaks, it's really difficult to work out the area under the peak because you've got loads of little peaks with small areas in. So an integration trace is normally added to a spectrum when you run it, um, and it's used to work out the height ratio. Though the height ratio of that integration trace is used um, to... Um, effectively correspond with the area ratio of each peak so it makes it a little bit easier so in practice what we do is we use a ruler to measure the vertical parts of that trace we write the lengths down and use these numbers to come up with a ratio okay so so you can see here there we go so we've just pulled up another spectrum there so in this spectrum we have a trace that shows a one to one and a half to one and a half um, ratio so if we round that up into whole numbers that's a two to three to three ratio but you see it's really difficult to see what the area of these peaks are underneath so this trace really makes it a lot easier to work out the hydrogen ratio so this tells us we have three different hydrogen environments uh, one with two hydrogens and the other environments have three hydrogens um, written in them <coughs> excuse me okay so substances that are tested have to be dissolved this might seem very obvious but they have to be dissolved in non-hydrogen based solvents to avoid confusing the spectra if we took our sample and dissolved it in water 
Water contains hydrogens, and so therefore NMR will pick up peaks associated with water. We don't want that, so we have to use an alternative, uh, an alternative solvent. You see, it doesn't get doesn't get easier, does it? There's always some problems in the way. So we can't use hydrogen-based solvents like water because of the proton. These would show in the spectrum. So we use solvents like deuterated substances, and they do not have hydrogen, like D2O. So deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen. So you don't need to worry. Don't need to worry too much about that. It just has two nucleons in there, and you can see it has the similar structure to water. It's like H2O, except it has two deuterium atoms instead. So as deuterium has an even number of nucleons, remember it's come back to that bit we said right at the start. It's not actually detected by the NMR machine. So the only peaks that will appear will be the peaks from the sample, and that's exactly what we want. We don't want interference from any other chemical. So we can use other sub other substances as well, like um, CCl4. Um, again, it has a similar principle. Um, it won't show up on a proton NMR um, because it doesn't have any hydrogen. So it's um, it's a great solvent to use um, that can be um, um, used to dissolve your uh, sample in that you want to test. Okay, so let's look at an example. So predict the structure of the compound using the data table from this proton NMR spectrum with a molecular formula of C4H8O2. So in this example, what we're doing is we're combining all of the techniques, all the different aspects of NMR, using all that to interpret this spectrum. Now, you'll need a data table available, so you can use the data table that we've got here, that's on this on this slide, uh, or, we can, um, or you can use it from your data sheet. It should still work the same way. So let's have a look. So we can see here, the first thing, we've got three hydrogen environments in a molecule with a ratio of two to three to three, which is likely to mean we have a CH2 and two CH3 groups within the molecule. So what we're doing is we're just coming up with ideas. Um, it might not be, but it's it's probably the closest guess. That's the first thing we could probably, is likely to deduce from this. So the peak at 4.1 um, has a value of two, which suggests this is a CH2 and using the data table, so using the, the, the data in that table, this suggests this structure here. So there's the hydrogen and the carbon here, and it's probably next to something like this, um, probably likely to be an ester or something like this. So the splitting pattern is a quartet, and this suggests that this CH2 is next to a carbon with three hydrogens, which is likely to be CH3. And we know that because we've kind of deduced it from here a little bit. So you see, we're just confirming and building up this picture. So the peak at 2.1, which is this one here, it has a value of three, which suggests it's a CH3. And using the data table, we can actually suggest its structure. So it looks like this. So we've got this particular one, this CH3, is actually bonded to a C double bond O. Now that actually kind of fits here. So maybe this particular peak here could be that because that actually fits, couldn't it? So we'll keep on going, we'll have a look. So the splitting pattern is singlet. So this suggests the CH3 is next to a carbon with no other hydrogens, hence the C double bond O. So that's told us a little bit more information because actually if we look at our overall structure, we know that this hydrogen is near a C double bond O, so it's likely to be there doesn't it? Um, it's going to be a CH3 bonded to a carbon. That doesn't have any hydrogen, so that really does fit. Let's keep going, though. So we've got a peak at 1.2, which is this one here. It has a value of 3, which suggests this is a CH3, and using the data table, this suggests this as this structure, so it's RCH3. Okay. This has a triplet peak, which means they must be next to a carbon with two hydrogens likely to be a CH2. That kind of fits in over here a little bit. So actually our structure is this. So here's our peaks. There's your three, there's your two, and there's your last one. So actually this is an ester. So you can see what we're doing is building up a little bit of the picture. And what I would always encourage you to do is like we say what we did there is to show write down your structure and make sure it actually matches the spectrum double check and um, if it does then you've you've hit the jackpot so there's a lot of marks for these as you can see there's a lot of work that goes into it um, so you know just make sure you're aware of it and it's practice for these that's that's imperative okay so we can establish as well 
if a sample is a little little bit of a, a hack here for this one so we can establish if a sample is an OH or NH uh, proton by using a method called proton exchange where we use something called D2O okay which we've seen before so what it can be is it can be difficult to identify specific OH and NH peaks as they can sit in a broad area of the spectrum okay so it's really difficult to identify them just from that so they are however normally found unsplit and do have a broad profile so we can kind of see them see them a little bit but if we add D2O to a sample under test and we run two spectra one with D2O and one without then we can actually notice a difference if something if we do have an OH or an NH so you can see if there's an OH or an NH uh, proton in the sample, then deuterium will take its place. So it will, it will displace that proton. So if there's an OH in there, the D will replace the H. So deuterium has an even number of nuclei, so it won't actually show up on the spectrum. So what that means is we can compare the two spectrum. So one with no D2O, and so there is, this could be an alcohol, for example, so OH. And the H on the alcohol can be displaced if we shake it with D2O and that peak disappears because deuterium is not detected by NMR because it's got an even number of nucleons. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, another type of um, technique and this is separate from NMR really, um, but it's, a, it's an important one because it also helps us to determine the structure of a sample. It's just another method of doing it. There's not a lot of information in this one to be honest. So this is called elemental analysis. An elemental analysis helps us determine the percentage composition or mass of elements that make up a compound. Okay, so you can see there's a there's an example of a machine. So it sits on top of a of a of a desk there. So if we know the molecular formula, okay, then we can work out the structure of a compound using elemental analysis. So this is as a in addition to um, to NMR. So the data that's produced from elemental analysis helps us to determine the empirical and molecular formula of the compound. So in other words, what we'll get is a spectrum and it'll say, right, this element has carbon, hydrogen, um, nitrogen and uh, oxygen in it. And it'll tell you the percentage, what percentage of that mass uh, or the percentage of the elements, uh, sorry, the percentage in that molecule, what percentage is made up of each element. So that can help us to determine the structure as well. Okay, so let's look at the last section of this of this video. Um, this is called um, combined techniques. So this is where we basically take all the different types of spectrum, um, and we have to be able to put them all together to work out what a what a substance is. So, so there we are. So we're going to try and um, work all this out and link it all together and um, make some use of it. So what we've got here, we've got three spectra of unknown organic compound, and we're going to try and identify this. And we've been given a proton NMR spectrum, we've been given a infrared, and we've been given a mass spectrum as well. Okay, so we've been given three different types. And we're going to use all three to deduce an unknown, uh, an unknown compound. So let's look at the uh, first one. This is a mass spectrum of an unknown substance. So what we can see here is from a mass spectrum is the MR of this molecule. So this is the M plus peak or M plus, um, so your, uh, M peak or M plus as it's normally known as. So this is a peak at 58 and it tells us the MR of the molecule. So we know this molecule is a mass of 58. And we have got a fragment here as well. And this fragment at 29 could be due to a CHO or a CH2, CH5. Okay, so this is a an idea because they have they both have masses of twenty nine. So from this, we can deduce that our mystery molecule has a molecular mass of fifty eight and may have a CHO uh, may have a CHO group in there. We need more information though. Okay, this is nowhere near enough to tell us exactly what this molecule is. Okay, so here's our infrared spectrum. So we can see we have a peak at one seven fifty. And this is likely to be caused by a CO group, so a carbonyl group. So all this data will be given on a data sheet or will be given you exam. You're not expected to know the, obviously the, what the numbers correspond to. So from this, we can deduce that we either have an aldehyde, a ketone, an ester, an acid chloride, or an acid anhydride. Okay, so we've narrowed it down a little bit, but it's not great. Um, it can't be, though, a carboxylic acid, as the peak doesn't sit between 2.5 to 3,300, and it can't be an amide, as there's no peak between 3,300 and 3,500. So we've narrowed it down a little bit. 
So we need more information. So let's have a look at the NMR spectrum then. So NMR tells us quite a lot. So it tells us that we have three different hydrogen environments in our spectrum. So you can see we've got this peak at 9.5 is due to a CHO group. And that corresponds to what we've seen before. These peaks are due to CH groups, so CH2, CH3, for example, and that's also confirmed within the infrared as well. Obviously, we'd seen that. So we've got the peak at 1, which is the earlier peak here, and that has an integration trace of 3, so an integration number of 3. And this suggests that we have a CH3, and this is a triplet, which means it's adjacent to a carbon with two hydrogens on because it's a triplet. And then if we look at the, the peak at 2.5, this is an integration of 2, as you can see there, which suggests um, the CH2, is it, this is a, a pentet, which means it's adjacent to um, carbons with, or a carbon or carbons, with four hydrogens. And this is likely to be near a CH3 and the CHO group, um, because we've identified that at 9.5, which is itself a triplet. So that means that that's got to be near a carbon with two hydrogens. So that kind of fits a little bit. Okay, so what we need to do now is now we've got these bits of information, we've got the pieces of the jigsaw, we now have to pull it all together um, and confirm it with, with all the different spectra. So the mass spectra told us that the substance has a molecular mass of 58. The infrared spectrum confirms that there is a C double bond O group. However, there were no other peaks to suggest any other functional group present. So we know there must be a, a carbonyl group in there. And the NMR, NMR also confirms the C double bond O group. Um, and this was part of an aldehyde group. So we know we must have an aldehyde here. NMR also confirms the presence of a CH2 and CH3 group, which when supported with the mass spectra information, um, that the molecule had a mass of 58, we can start to build our molecule now. And this is actually our molecule. This is it. This is propan al. So you can see we do have the aldehyde group. We have the CH3 and the CH2 group. Uh, and if you add all that up, it does have a mass of 58. And so that's it. Um, so there's a lot of information there. Um, I did say um, why they call it, uh, why hospitals don't call it NMR. Um, it's mainly because um, a lot of patients um, look, see the word nuclear and start to panic and think they're going to get radiated, which of course, if you know what NMR is, that is just not the case. Um, it just uses strong magnets um, and um, you're not actually, um, you're not actually radiated with a gamma or x-rays or anything harmful like that um, so um, to soften that they call it magnetic resonance imaging so they take the nuclear bit out so that's that's the reason why um, even though the stuff is exactly the same okay so um, that is it there's a lot of stuff there um, for spectroscopy NMR is quite tough as you can see keep practicing there's a full range of videos for OCRA on um, on allergy chemistry uh, please subscribe they're all for free as long as people keep subscribing I'll keep them free um, so um, they're all for free so uh, please just subscribe if you do want a copy of this uh, of this PowerPoint and um, then you've just click in the link in the description box and you'll be able to get them there they're great value okay that's it bye bye